the, the, the summary of, of my talk today is uh, first, I will try to justify why it's important to, to use single crystalline low dimensional um, nanomaterials for, for resistive gas sensing. Then I will review a little bit the, the synthesis methods we have uh, employed. Then I will discuss also the integration of these nanomaterials in transducers for, for achieving uh, sensors, so these nanomaterial integration aspects. Then I will show you just a few results about the gas sensing tests and, and also some particular detection mechanisms. And, and finally, there will be a conclusion and, and some outlook. So the idea is why, why do we need or why it's important to use this, this sort of nanomaterials for, for gas sensing? And the idea is that if, if we use low dimensional materials, we have most of the atoms that they are on the surface. Okay. I mean, they have very, very large surfaces and, and very large also surface to volume ratio. So this means that most of the atoms or a, a significant number of the atoms of the nanomaterial, they are exposed in fact to the environment. So they offer very high uh, specific surface area. So we ha can have nanoparticles, nanowires, nanorods, and even two dim what we call two-dimensional materials. If they are single crystalline, as, as compared to polycrystalline materials, which are often very used in, in these resistive gas sensors, they, they offer a better uh, surface composition control. So this means that uh, we can understand better what are the sensing mechanisms. Uh, with some of the methods we have implemented for synthesizing them, we can achieve a, a just a one go uh, synthesis and functionalization or decoration with nanoparticles of other metal oxides. So we can reach the, the growth, the synthesis and the functionalization at the same time. So since, since we, we have this very high specific surface area, we can expect to, to, to have uh, dramatic changes in the response, so we, to achieve high response. So let's say that, that metal oxides, the main problem, it's not really achieving high response. They are very sensitive materials in principle. The, problem, the main problem with, with metal oxides is the lack of selectivity. So this is something that we will talk also. And, and finally, well, I mean, if we are implementing a resistive uh, detection, this means that the transducers are very simple. What we only need, in fact, is, is a couple of electrodes to measure uh, the resistance of the, of the material. And some of the times we need to integrate a heater because these materials, they normally don't work at room temperature. We need to heat them above, um, above room temperature. Okay, and, and one, one Thing that it's very important. I mean, if we want these materials to become successful in the market, we need to, to use the scalable methods for the mass production of these nanomaterials and also to find easy ways to integrate them into the substrates. Okay, so just in a very simple... Uh, in a very simplistic way, why we can expect a, a very strong uh, change in resistance, for example, in nanomaterials. So if we have, for example, a very thin nanowire, uh, um, this, this nanowire of a metal oxide will have uh, oxygen species that being attached to the surface. And, and this could, for example, complete, for example, completely deplete of charged carriers, the nanowire. So we, we can expect here having a very, very uh, large uh, resistance of a film made of, of these uh, nanomaterials. And as soon as we have, for example, a reducing uh, species like carbon monoxide uh, that is going to react with these oxygen species, we will remove part of this oxygen that is initially absorbed at the surface, releasing electrons. And this is going to create a uh, an internal channel for conduction of these electrodes. Okay, in, the, in this example, I'm assuming that the semiconductor is an n-type semiconductor. And uh, as I told you before, in, in some of the methodologies for synthesizing this, these wires, we can have at the same time the wire and maybe some other metal oxides in the form of nanoparticles that are attached on the surface. So we can expect to reach uh, different kind of, uh, of mechanisms for enhancing this uh, sensitivity, which can be related to the catalytic properties of these, um, uh, of these nanoparticles, but also to some other types of chemical sensitization effects. So this is just to give a, an overview 
non-exhaustive about uh, the, the different materials we, we are able to synthesize. For example, on the, on the top row, what you see are, are um, indium oxide octahedra, so we can have them either uh, pure or we can decorate them with, with nanoparticles. For example, in the examples you see here, it's palladium or platinum nanoparticles that they are uh, sitting on the, on the surfaces. So you see that the surfaces, they are very clear, very, very neat. So, so we, we can um, achieve in that case uh, a well-known surface chemistry, let's say, but we can also synthesize, for example, nanoneedles. So what you see are forests of, of nanoneedles and we can have them decorated with tiny nanoparticles. In the example you have in the middle row, these were uh, tungsten trioxide needles decorated with um, more or less one, two nanometer uh, nickel oxide nanoparticles. Okay, so, so these were, were grown by aerosol assisted CBD. The first one was vapor phase transport. And then on the, on the, on the uh, bottom uh, row you have on, on, in this side, you have forests of vertically aligned zinc oxide uh, nanowires, which are grown via a CVD but catalyzed process. And, and then we have also, for example, tungsten trioxide nanoneedles with uh, platinum uh, nanoparticles on top. Okay, so just discussing very briefly the synthesis methods. For example, if we want to get this vertically aligned forest of zinc oxide, uh, nanowires, we need to use uh, a, a standard catalyzed CVD, which is run at atmospheric pressure, but at very high temperature, more or less 900 centigrade. And we need to prepare a substrate with some catalyst. So we need first, for example, to uh, spatter, deposit some, some gold. Then when, when we reach this 900 centigrade, we don't have any more uh, film, but, but uh, we have just nanopart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was too boring, maybe, so... <laughs> no, my counter is reset. I know. Still... Well, yeah, 13. Okay, here it is. So, so well, I mean, in this case, we need to prepare. I was, I was telling you the, the substrate with some gold nanoparticles, and, and then we are, we are achieving by CVD the growth of this uh, vertically aligned uh, nanowires. If we use an aerosol-assisted CVD, this is, this is a vo vapor solid, which means that uh, it's a self-catalyzed process. We don't need to prepare our substrate with, with uh, catalytic particles to grow the nanowires. And for example, in using this method, we have grown either tungsten trioxide or um, nanowires or uh, tin oxide nanorods. So the, the growth uh, temperature, it, it changes. So it, it spans over a wide range, for example, for the Tin, for the tungsten trioxide, we, we can grow nanowires at 380 centigrade, more or less. And if we want this tin oxide, we have to go up to 620. And we can either grow these uh, nanowires or nanorods pure or decorated with uh, metal nanoparticles. So we have tried, for example, with gold, with cobalt, with copper, with nickel, platinum, palladium. In most of the cases, uh, what we get, they're not just metal nanoparticles, but in fact, what we get is metal oxide nanoparticles. So the aerosol-assisted CVD method is, is a method in which you don't need your precursors 
to be volatile. You, you just generate an aerosol with them, so you need to, um, let's say, uh, mix with salt or di dissolve in solvents. You need to dissolve them in solvents. And then you generate these droplets with, with uh, an ultrasonic uh, vaporizer, and then you convey them to the, um, to the reactor in which you have the, the deposition. And um, for example, finally, for, for the indium oxide octahedra, what we can use is either a vapor phase transport. So this happens, again, at very high temperature, more or less 1,000 centigrade. Or we could, for example, use an oxidation process from, from an indium chloride salt. And in that case, we can go more or less to 500 centigrade. So the idea here is that we can implement different sorts of, of uh, growing mechanisms. And, and you see that the, uh, the operating temperature or the, the deposition temperature changes, changes quite a lot. And this creates problems when you need to integrate them in your, in your uh, transducers. Sorry. Okay. Don't know what I touch here. Yeah. Right. So we we are using we are using different type of uh, transducers. So it can be either um, MEMS transducers, in which we have different um, yeah we have different membranes uh, where we can operate them. Uh, di uh, separately, so we can set different operating temperatures, and in these membranes we have just electrodes, and on top of this we are growing the, the film. So we can we can use um, alumina substrates, so these are ceramic standard substrates, or we can use uh, other other sorts of silicon substrates in which we have, for example, a narrow uh, gap in between two electrodes, and we are growing the film here on top. So this is more or less 14 microns uh, gap in between, but also, we are using uh, uh, flexible um, substrates more recently. So we have a, a different range of, uh, basically, they are polyimide. Uh, so it's Captain Upilex uh, substrates in which we can stencil or we can inject print uh, the electrodes and the heaters. And, and then we can, we can put the film uh, on top. Okay, so the, of course, the requirements for using this sort of substrates, they, they, vary, they vary a lot. So, for example, uh, if we are using the aerosol CVD method, we can do the direct growth, or we can implement the direct growth of the nanomaterials on, on our membrane. So there's, there's no need to transfer anything. So you, we can either use this passively, which means putting this uh, silicon uh, dye into a, a, what we call a hot wall reactor. So we have the reactions and, and then the growth of the nanomaterials. Or we, what, or what we can do is what we did in here, which is use the heaters to reach the necessary reaction temperature. So we have the, the nanomaterials growing directly on top of the membranes. In that case, it's, it's tin oxide uh, nanorods. And as I told you before, um, for the flexible substrates, in some cases, we can implement also the, the growth, the direct growth in the flexible substrate, because as I told you before, in some cases, the aerosol-assisted CVD method can be conducted at 380 centigrade. So this means that these substrates, this is what we did. I mean, we, starting from, from the substrate with the electrodes, we, we grew directly the, the forest of, of uh, tungsten trioxide uh, nanowires. Uh, on top of the of the nanomaterial, okay, but this is not always possible. So basically, what happens is that as, as long as we are using, for example, a method in which the the synthesis temperatures they go to 900 or 1000 centigrade, of course, this cannot be implemented specifically on 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 flexible substrates. So then, what we need is just uh, to use uh, another technique, which is use a, a standard substrate in which we can grow the nanomaterials and then remove them by a physical method, for example, sort of razor blade or ultrasonic, so we can make a suspension of these nanomaterials and then, for example, use a spray coating or, or screen printing or even develop a printable ink and do some inkjet printing. So this is an example of, of using a, a suspension of the first technique and then we can use, for example, an, an airbrusher, so a, a spray 
coating system and, and we achieve uh, films that are very thin because what we, you can see here is across the film you see the electrodes, they are sitting, uh, they are sitting below. Okay, so this is, for example, when we, when we use the screen printing, so we have stencil electrodes, once they are burned, once they are covered, and in that case we were just <coughs> coating a film of indium oxide uh, octahedra that were obtained from, from the oxidation of an indium chloride uh, uh, precursor. So the idea is that we can also so use this technique, and, and more recently we are starting to develop also the uh, inks, printable inks, and we are using an inkjet printer to have a fully, in, in the end, to have a fully printed sensor. So you, you can inkjet print the, the transducer, and then you can also inkjet print your nanomaterials on top. Okay, so if, if I show, I, I want to show you a little bit and discuss some of the gas sensing tests and, and detection mechanisms, and this is the case when we were using uh, not not flexible, but MEM substrate. So you see here, these are, are tungsten uh, trioxide nanowires uh, grown on, on top of the membranes. When we check what are the crystalline phases, we get that we have just the monoclinic phase. Uh, so this platinum and boron nitrate, in fact, they come from the membrane. There's nothing to be with the film. Uh, and the film is tungsten trioxide, which is slightly, it's almost almost stoichiometric, but it's slightly oxygen defective. And these are two examples when we were um, decorating the nanowires with palladium and with copper. And what we are achieving is palladium oxide or a mixture of copper oxides uh, on top. So for example, when we, when we check uh, the idea of developing the sensor uh, with uh, tungsten trioxide and copper and copper oxides on top was for, for achieving uh, selectivity to hydrogen sulfide. So these are the, the typical responses we get. This is for a bare sensor and then uh, here in orange you have for a copper decorated um, tungsten trioxide sensors and when you check more or less with different gases what you realize is that we are having a, a stronger response for hydrogen sulfide compared to other uh, possible sp species that might be might be there. So the reason for for this increased uh, performance is because copper oxides are in fact p-type, and then you have the nanowire which is uh, n-type. So there is a depletion area uh, happening here. So you are achieving in this state an increased resistance of your film when you expose this to hydrogen sulfide you have this copper oxide becoming uh, metallic copper sulfide and this is a reversible process so if you expose again to clean oxygen uh, this is uh, let's say that here the heterojunction is destroyed which means that the, there is a, an increase in in the conductance of your system and then when you expose this to oxygen you go back to the previous situation and this is let's say very pretty selective for the case of hydrogen sulfide, which means that you are achieving uh, a quite selective hydrogen sulfide, uh, sulfide uh, sensor in the end. And this is basically uh, the same approach, but in that case using palladium oxide decorated nanowires. And uh, in, so you're seeing here that, for example, the, we achieve a very high response to hydrogen when we have these palladium oxide nanoparticles on top of the nanowires and we are achieving very, very low responses. So in that case also we are achieving a sensor that is very selective to hydrogen. And even when we operate it at a temperature that is not room temperature, but very near, we still have a very high response, which is over 20. And the idea here, why, why do you have this? So we have again a P-type um, metal oxide uh, sitting on top of the nanowire. So we are just transferring electrons uh, from the nanowire to the nanoparticle in the presence of oxygen. So this means that we are narrowing the conducting channel and, and we, we achieve a very high resistance. And in the presence of hydrogen at these low temperatures, we can form this palladium hydride. And also this be, be, behaves as a sort of metal. So we are just uh, uh, transferring electrons back to the n-type semiconductor and, and just this, this uh, space, space charge region decreases, so we are increasing the, the conductivity of, of the system. Okay? So this is um, basically what happens with a standard MEMS transducer and what happens, for example, when we use a, 
uh, polymeric transducers, so a flexible transducer. So the idea here is I, I just uh, rem uh, remember or remind you that we were directly growing this, this uh, tungsten trioxide nanowires on the, um, on the flexible substrate via the aerosol assisted CVD. And these are the, the, the response that we get for hydrogen with platinum. I mean, it's again a sensor which is mainly developed for detecting hydrogen in that case. And what we achieve is a very nice uh, baseline. You see that the responses also, they are very clear. And when we compare what is the performance or the response for 100 ppms when, when we have a MEMS and when we have the, the polyamide uh, sensor, what you see is that there is a difference in the, in the response, but this, this difference is not very important, in fact. So we can say that they behave pretty much the, the same. So this, this might be due also to the different electrogeometry. So, so it's what we can say, uh, or the main <laughs> conclusions would be that in that case, what we achieve on flexible substrate is, is pretty comparable to what we are able to achieve on, on a MEM substrate. <clears throat> this is more recent. So you see in that case, what we were doing is compare the use of the indium oxide octahedra that had been synthesized at a at too high temperature to integrate directly on, on the flexible substrate. So there is no way to, to grow directly this indium oxide oct uh, octahedra on the, on the flexible substrate. And we were comparing two sensors, one flexible, what, one on, in ceramic with exactly the same electrogeometry to see what was the behavior. So you see that here we are not exactly to the point. Uh, that we were before. You see that we have a very nice baseline here, very well defined uh, response for the, for the rigid uh, ceramic substrate. And what we get with the, uh, with the flexible, you see that we, we can see some drift. So these are three repeated cycles for detecting NO2 with different increasing concentrations. And we have, uh, what we can see drift. And I mean, it's reproducible. You see that it's, it's pretty reproducible, but it's not as good as what we get on, on, on this. So this, this means that we need to work a little bit more to, to optimize uh, the system. And well, the idea is that if you have a flexible substrate, you need to check what happens when you flex it. And this is a video that it's, just, just to illustrate the idea, so it takes, it takes a lot. I will just, oh, come on. So let's see if I can show it more accelerated. Yeah, so you see it's, I don't know if you can see it here. Here we have the, the substrate. It's, it's not that easy to see, but anyway. And the idea is that we can flex it, you see? And when we reach to that point, okay, we go back again to the original position. And we have, it is wired because we are monitoring the changes in the resistance of the film while we are flexing. And this is done maybe 100 times. Okay, and the outcome is that as you see, when, when we have a, this will be the baseline resistance of the system when, when your, your substrate is flat. And then when basically there is a dramatic change in the resistance when you do this concave bend, which means that you are having some sort of compressive stress in your film. But anyway, after many, after many changes and after many compressions, when you go back to, to flat, what you can see is that basically your, your baseline resistance hasn't changed a lot. So it, it remains pretty much stable, which means that you're at least the sensor is withstanding the flexing and it goes back to the original position. So you are not in principle, in principle damaging your film after many, many flexors. So, well, apart, one, one of the important things, let's say, for, for uh, using these flexible sensors also is that we need to try to operate all these uh, metal oxides at low temperatures. And one way maybe to do that is instead of using heaters, it's just, uh, it's just uh, using um, UV activation. Okay, so what we were doing here is not, it's operating the sensor at room temperature, but using UV modulation, to, to activate the, the detection in that case was NO2. So what you see here are pulses of increasing concentrations of NO2 in the, in the parts per billion range. And here you have the standard uh, resistance change. So what you see is that 
In fact, since the uh, metal oxide is operated at room temperature, you don't reach any stable situation and you are not even regaining the baseline. Okay? But what we do then is we apply this uh, modulation and if we just enlarge this part of the signal, what you see is this sort of ripple in here. So when you are in fact uh, irradiating with UV light, what you are doing is cleaning the surface. So you are removing the NO2 from the surface and you get an increase uh, you, you get a, uh, sorry, a decrease in the, in the resistance of the sensor because we are, this is an N-type uh, material again, so NO2 is uh, an electron uh, withdrawing gas, so it's taking electrons from the material, so when we get rid of the NO2, what we are having is more electrons, so the resistance is falling, and then when we just uh, switch off the when we switch off the, the UV light, we are, since we are in the presence of NO2, NO2 is getting again attached to the surface and the, increase, and the resistance increases. Okay, so the idea is that what we were checking is these rates, so the rate of this, of this uh, change, and, and what you can see in here is that when, when we check with this rate of change of the resistance uh, due to this UV modulation, we, we reach these pulses and the, the amplitude, well, on the first place, you see that the dynamics for reaching this plateau are much faster than the response, okay? And the second part is that they, you reach this plateau, which is dependent, let's say, on the concentration. So you can do some sort of calibration curves, and this is what you get for the operation at room temperature, okay? So this is for, for increasing concentrations of NO2, and this is the response. If you combine the UV with some heating, and in that case it's sort of mild heating, so this is 50 centigrade and then 100 centigrade, then what happens basically is that you increase the sensitivity of your system. So you see that the slope of these calibration curves is getting uh, higher and higher, which means that you are increasing sensitivity, but you are, of course, also consuming more power because you need to heat your system. So I have just compared here what happens with the standard with the standard operation, which is not UV light, it's just 130 centigrade uh, always, and you have a response time here, and you have the sensitivity, and power consumption doesn't matter. I mean, the substrate is not very well um, optimized for, for power consumption. It's in the hundreds of milliwatts anyway, so this will be 100%. And if we go to room temperature, we apply the UV light, the pulsed UV light, you see that the response time Okay, it's, it's worse, and also the sensitivity, but at least we remain for these in the same order of magnitude of sensitivity of the response, but the power consumption is reduced from 100% to 4.8%. So there is a strong reduction in, in power consumption. Okay, and with, with a similar idea about trying to ameliorate also sensor dynamics, one, one of the things we've been working uh, is on the closed loop um, operation of, of these sensors. In that case, what we are doing is just to, modula to modulate the operating temperature to try to keep the, the conductance of the sensor at the same level. So normally we are, we are used to uh, inject, for example, a gas, and then we monitor the, the resistance change. Here we inject the gas, and, it's, and we do not allow the resistance to, to change. So for keeping the same value of the resistance, what we need to do is to alter the operating temperature of the sensor. So the problem is that when we, uh, we do a sort of step change in the concentration of a gas, we are triggering two sort of responses, or the response, the dynamic response of the sensor. They have something that changes very fast, and then you have a drift effect. So the idea is that we want to get rid of this second part of the response, and we can, in fact, achieve a, um, a reduction of, of the response time, but about a factor of 50, employing this, employing this technique. And, well, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm getting near to the, to the end now. So the idea is if, if we are using this sort of uh, sensors that can be operated near, nearly to room temperature, or they can be UV activated, and we are also developing uh, flexible electronics and flexible sensors, the idea in, to, in the end is try to have this sort of widespread systems that uh, for, so this sort of um, tags 
with uh, onboard sensing capability. And this is something that we developed a few years ago, and it was not based on the metal oxide, it was based on carbon nanotubes. But this is just because carbon nanotubes, they are very sensitive to NO2, and they can work at room temperature. So that's why we developed this sort of, of system in which we have antennas and we have a uh, logic circuitry that can uh, drive the sensor and, and recover the, va the value of the resistance and then transmit this. And this is an example of the system. In, in black, you, you have different um, concentrations of NO2, so that these are the responses when it works wired, but also when it works in, in wireless mode. And this is what well, this is a sort of RFID system, and you can use a commercial, very low cost uh, reader based on a ultra wideband radar to, to make this measurement. So the idea is now that we are achieving also low power consumptions and nearly room temperature operation of metal oxides, we could replace the carbon nanotubes. So if I have, no, it's over, over. <laughs> okay, so well, that was just the, the conclusions about that anyway. So, so thank you very much and.